Hello, everyone. Welcome to the 2020 Hot Topics in Environmental Law Lecture Series brought to you by the Environmental Law Center at Vermont Law School. I'm Jenny Rushlow. I'm the director of the Environmental Law Center and associate dean for environmental programs at VLS. I'm going to bring up a page with resources on the screen to direct you to some of our programs at the Environmental Law Center if you're looking to get more information. Um, <clears throat> you can also view our full Hot Topics lineup by going to the website vermontlaw.edu backslash hot dash topics. Each talk is worth one Vermont CLE credit, so if you're looking to collect those credits, please keep track for your records. And there will be time for question and answers at the end of today's presentation. And to ask your question, please type it into the chat box at any time during the lecture, and we'll get to as many of them as we can with the remaining time. Today, we are pleased to welcome Heather Rowley and Delciana Winders. Dr. Heather Rowley is the Supervising Veterinarian for Captive Animal Law Enforcement at the PETA Foundation. In that position, she leads investigative and enforcement actions in cases of abuse of animals in roadside zoos, circuses, and other captive animal exhibits in the U.S. Dr. Rowley's involvement in the undercover investigation and law enforcement of the Hump Restaurant in Santa Monica for serving endangered whale meat was featured in the acclaimed documentary Racing Extinction, which highlighted her work as a lead investigator into wildlife crime and trafficking across the world. She's published multiple articles on ocean conservation and marine wildlife, and is a co-author of a forthcoming chapter on animal welfare and the Endangered Species Act in the third edition of the American Bar Association treatise on the Endangered Species Act law and policy. Dr. Rowley is a graduate of UC Santa Barbara and has a bachelor's in biological sciences and received her doctorate in veterinary medicine from Western University College of Veterinary Medicine where she focused on wildlife medicine and forensic pathology. Delcy Winders is assistant clinical professor and director of the Animal Law Litigation Clinic at our friend Lewis and Clark Law School. She previously served as vice president and deputy general counsel at the PETA Foundation and was the first academic fellow at the Harvard Animal Law and Policy Program, as well as a visiting scholar at Pace University Law School. Her primary interests are in animal law and administrative law, and her work has appeared in multiple journals, and she has a, also has a forthcoming book chapter on the Endangered Species Act and captive wildlife. She received her bachelor's degree in legal studies with highest honors at UC Santa Cruz and her JD is from NYU. Following law school, she clerked for um, a justice in the US Court of Appeals for the Sixth Circuit and practice animal law in a variety of settings. Professors Rally and Winders are co-teaching along with Don Bauer, the VLS summer session class, Animal Welfare Law. And today their talk that they'll present is called Protecting Pigs in the Era of Deregulation. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Heather Rally and Professor Dulcy Winders. Thank you, Jenny. And thanks to everyone uh, for joining us today. I appreciate it. I'm going to try to share my screen now. This is all new territory for everyone. So hopefully this works out well. Okay. So Although it's well established that uh, pigs are highly intelligent, they're sensitive, they're playful and emotional, um, they actually have very few legal protections. And sadly, even those limited protections are currently under assault. Today, we're gonna be discussing the dissonance between our scientific knowledge about pigs and our current laws with an emphasis on recent legal efforts to enhance protections for pigs. But I'm gonna begin with a discussion of who pigs are to highlight some of the amazing things that we know about these animals. And then I'll discuss how pigs are used for food in the United States, um, how they're bred, raised, transported, slaughtered, et cetera, and how those practices impact their well-being. And then I will hand it over to Delcy to discuss the legal status of pigs in the US, as well as the current efforts to scale back what little protections pigs have and what we can do, not just to ensure that these protections stay in place, but to bring legal protections for pigs more align, in line with scientific knowledge and society's values. 
But first, we must strive to understand who pigs are. <laughs> pigs are, of course, a domesticated species, um, but it's noteworthy that unlike some domesticated species, such as dogs, who've been selectively bred for certain behavioral traits, oops, jumping ahead, um, for certain behavioral traits take, um, you know, personality traits, for example, uh, pigs have by and large been bred for physical traits, such as body size, meat quality, of course, because we use them for food. So this means that pigs have retained a good deal of their wild nature and today are behaviorally not too dissimilar to wild boar. And that's important because it does have implications for their welfare in a captive setting. Uh, one of the primary ways that animals suffer in captive environments is through behavioral deprivation, being inhibited from engaging in their most basic, highly motivated and genetically ingrained behaviors. And in pigs, one of those behaviors is one of the most important ones is foraging. Um, if given the opportunity, pigs will spend a significant portion of their day foraging traveling about with their noses in the earth, smelling around in search for food. Um, rooting is one of those behaviors that they use to search for food. And it's been said that a rooting pig is a happy pig. And there's really something to that. Pigs have this incredibly advanced sense of smell, um, which is many hundreds, if not thousands of times stronger than a human being's sense of smell. They use their noses, um, not just to search for food, but also to communicate and to interact with each other and even to identify one another. Pigs are highly social creatures. The social unit of a pig consists generally of several females and their piglets in a, in a herd. And pigs are capable of remembering individual pigs and establishing very strong social bonds with other individuals. In fact, pigs are known to exhibit symptoms of depression at the loss of a social companion to whom they are very bonded. And it's also well known that pigs who are socially isolated become incredibly distressed. That's a very distressing experience for a pig. Um, pigs are inquisitive, they're playful, and they're emotional creatures. And a pig's ability to engage in those play behaviors, are, it's critical for their healthy development, um, psychological and emotional development. And being denied that ability has lifelong consequences for that animal. They're also incredibly intelligent. Pigs have repeatedly excelled at a variety of problem solving tasks that we've given them. And in fact, they genuinely enjoy a mental challenge. Amazingly, pigs have successfully learned to use a mirror to help them locate objects um, that they can't see in their immediate vicinity. And that indicates that they, when given the opportunity, um, they have an understanding of that concept of reflection. And they can also learn kind of amazingly, they can learn to use a joystick to control an on-screen cursor and use that cursor on the screen to obtain an on-screen target. And so for us, that might sound somewhat simple, but it actually indicates a, a fairly complex cognitive capacity known as self-agency or the ability to recognize actions caused by oneself. Pigs are um, incredible spatial learners. There are very few animals on the planet who could rival a pig in a maze. And they're in natural social learners as well. Pigs demonstrate a simple form of empathy called emotional contagion, which means that they are attuned to, and in some cases can absorb the emotional state of other pigs around them. As for the actual lives of pigs in America, this is closer to what it looks like. Um, there are 77.6 million pigs in the United States at any given time. This was a statistic as of March before COVID hit. Um, as um, it is also estimated that nearly, nearly 130 pigs were sent to slaughter in 2019. So 129.9 million pigs. Um, and then 98.3 of those animals were raised in a contens intensive confinement on factory farm sort of setting. And of those animals um, at, alive in these farms at any given time, about 6 million of them are sows or um, female breeding females. Um, this is what a breeding female's life looks like. And despite being banned in a number of countries around the world, gestation crates, like the one you can see on the screen, remain the standard in over um, three quarters of US hog farms today. These crates are approximately two feet wide by seven feet long, which is just about exactly the size of a pig's body. 
In fact, it's so close to her body size that she's completely unable to turn around or really move much in either direction. This is the crate she'll be confined to for practically her entire life, beginning with her first pregnancy, which may begin as early as eight months of age. She will be confined to this crate for the duration of her four month pregnancy, after which she'll be transferred to a farrowing crate, which is only, which is a crate that's marginally larger to accommodate her and piglets for between 10 and 28 days to give birth and to nurse her piglets for a short period of time. After the premature weaning of her piglets, she's immediately returned to this gestation crate and the whole process repeats again. Even though pigs can naturally live to be up to 20 years old, sows on these farms are generally slaughtered after only two to three years because that's when their productivity begins to decrease. In order to understand how much suffering these animals endure, it's really important for us to look at their natural behaviors during pregnancy and birth. A mother pig would naturally seek isolation and a site for building her nest within one to two days before her babies are born. Uh, to do so, she would travel up to several miles in search of the right nest. And once she finds that nest, she would spend significant time making it perfect. She will hollow it out by rooting. She'll begin um, selecting very carefully, collecting a diverse array of plant materials. And ultimately her nest will contain several carefully constructed distinct layers composed of different materials that help provide structure, insulation, and comfort. And at the end of that process, her nest could contain over 500 pounds of plant material. So you can imagine the process that goes into creating this, this nest. Um, after birth, the piglets are then, they're nursed and then they're socially integrated with the rest of the herd by the end of the second week, but they continue nursing during that time. So weaning is a really gradual process for these animals and takes place over a period of, over a period of up to 19 weeks. As you can imagine, the drive to engage in these nesting behaviors is strong. And when a mother is confined so intensively during this important time, she suffers dramatic psychological consequences. And these manifest in the development of abnormal, repetitive, mindless behaviors, which we call stereotypic behaviors, such as bar biting. And these are indicative of suffering and chronic deprivation. In addition to psychological suffering, of course, these animals suffer from a variety of physical ailments as a result of their intensive confinement, including skin abrasions from rubbing on metal bars, muscle and bone deformities, overgrown and infected hooves from living on surfaces like concrete and being exposed to their own excrement, and joint disease from extreme movement restriction and again from hard surfaces. As for piglets, they're welcomed into this world with a variety of routine mutilations, none of which um, involve the use of anesthesia or pain relief. Despite being banned in several countries, including the UK, Ireland, Australia, and New Zealand, male pigs in the US are routinely castrated within days, often the first day of birth. Um, to do so, they're restrained and two, and two incisions are made using a scalpel into the scrotal sac and their testes are removed by tearing, incising or crushing the spermatic cord. In addition to this, in the intensive confinement and overcrowding that, um, that's created by these conditions are ripe for aggression and cannibalism. And so pigs under these conditions are known to bite each other's tails off, to inflict other serious injuries on one another with their sharp milk teeth that they're born with. To prevent this, pigs are, um, they routinely have their milk teeth clipped and their tails cut off within the first few days of life. All of this is again done without pain relief. Ear notching is another mutilation that's performed for identification purposes. After this, pigs are confined to barren pens where competition for limited space and resources leads to a life of chronic stress and excessive aggression. Um, they'll be moved through several stages of growth, which often take place at several different facilities, at least two different facilities. So the pigs are shipped out for their final growing and finishing stage before being shipped again to slaughter at around 280 pounds. 
Um, the conditions under which pig pigs are shipped is also worth a mention here because it's such a terrifying experience for them. Studies have looked at this and they've determined that that sensation of vibration that's emitted from a truck is a very aversive sensation to a pig. Yet these animals are routinely stacked practically on top of each other and shipped at least two or more times during their lives. Sometimes that shipment is over hundreds of miles under extreme temperatures for prolonged periods without food and water. Injuries and deaths are so commonplace um, during shipments that approximately 300,000 pigs arrive to slaughterhouses dead every year. Now, that's a staggering number, but it's commonplace. It's one that's considered a standard cost of doing business for this industry. Finally, if they survive the tumultuous journey to the stage of their lives, they'll of course be slaughtered for their meat. Throughout the journey and upon arrival, these animals are handled with electric prods, which inflict unnecessary pain and distress, but help these slaughterhouses keep up with this average processing rate of approximately 1,000 pigs per hour. In addition to that 300,000 dead animals, at least 500,000 pigs arrive at slaughter so sick, pained, or fatigued that they cannot stand. This is called a, down pig, a downed pig. A downed pig is an animal who will who is either unwilling or unable to rise despite that electric prodding and other coercive tactics that are used. And these animals typically are suffering from extreme fatigue, dehydration, injury, or other illness. Delcy's gonna talk a bit more about pigs, uh, downed pigs in her section, so I'll leave it there. Um, but once they reach the slaughter line, pigs are stunned with either an electric shock or exposure to CO2. Electrical shock, of course, happens quickly, but the success of that shock relies heavily upon proper positioning of that animal, the voltage settings, and it also requires pigs to be physically isolated from one another, which of course we've discussed is very distressing to them. CO2 exposure, on the other hand, occurs much more slowly, um, and pigs do not need to be separated from one another, but the high concentrations of that gas can result in irritation to the mucous membranes, the sensitive membranes on the, of the eyes and mouth, and sign, um, signs of distress as well. So gasping for air, panic, um, especially in the last 30 seconds before death. Um, these are our humane slaughter method for quote unquote humane slaughter methods for pigs. Um, what's more, uh, studies have demonstrated that a failure to effectively stun these animals occurs in up to 12% of cases. So on that cheery note, I'm going to pass the mic over to Delcy to discuss some of the legal protections. Thank you, Dr. Rally. So I hope that those of you who are listening are now wondering how it is that all of this and really indeed any of this is allowed. How is it that we know for a fact that pigs are extremely intelligent, sensitive, playful, emotional creatures, really not that different from dogs. And yet every year in the United States, we confine millions of them to spaces so tiny they can barely move around, let alone engage in their genetically ingrained uh, behaviors like rooting. We cut off numerous parts of their bodies without painkillers. We crowd them into transport trailers in extreme temperatures so bad that every year hundreds of thousands of them are dead on arrival at the slaughterhouse. And then for those who do make it alive to the slaughterhouse, we often violently force them to their deaths and fail to properly render them unconscious before their throats are slit and sometimes even before they're dropped into scalding tanks. Most people care about animals and most people would not want to support any of these practices, let alone all of them with their purchases. And yet most people eat pork products and 98.3% uh, of pigs in the United States come from these intensive confinement systems. And it's really important to let that figure set in, 98.3%. I, I so often hear from people that they go out of their way to purchase what they believe are humane products because, and therefore they don't support factory farms. And I, I believe that these people truly believe that. Um, in part because of the plethora of misleading labeling claims out there that take advantage of the public's compassion. 
And the focus of today's talk isn't labeling, but I think it's important to note at the outset that there is no legal definition of terms like humanely raised on label labeling claims and that the U.S. Department of Agriculture routinely approves labeling claims related to animal raising with very little and often even zero documentation whatsoever. So be very wary of those labeling claims. Polling consistently shows that Americans, the vast majority of Americans, care about animals who are raised for food and believe that these animals should not suffer. And yet, the vast majority of animals raised for food do indeed suffer. They suffer a lot. So where is the disconnect? A lot of it has to do with our laws. Our legal system has been carefully constructed not just to tolerate these abuses, but in many instances to actually affirmatively facilitate the exploitation of farmed animals. To give you just one example, I'd like you to consider the following statement from a pork industry expert who was commenting on the many pigs arriving dead at slaughterhouses in the United States. As you heard from Dr. Raleigh, that's um, well over 300,000 each year. He said, quote, most of these deaths are probably avoidable. The industry regards them as acceptable. Death losses during transport are too high, amounting to more than 8 million per year. But it doesn't take a lot of imagination to figure out why we load as many hogs on a truck as we do. It's cheaper. Even with the zero death rate that might be associated with providing more space on the truck, the hogs we save would not be enough to pay for the increased transportation costs of hauling fewer hogs on a load. It's the end of the quote. Remarkably candid. Um, simply put, in the absence of legal protections, it comes down to dollars and cents, and the animals are always going to lose out in that kind of scenario. Their lives are literally going to be a cost of doing business, as Dr. Raleigh indicated. All of this is compounded by the fact that we're in an era of deregulation, and so that the few legal protections that pigs and other farmed animals had are currently under assault. Because the law has played such a critical role in facilitating the suffering of farmed animals, suffering again that the vast majority of Americans say they don't want to support and yet do in fact support, perhaps unwittingly, the law is an integral piece of the puzzle if we're ever to address this suffering. Right now, the most urgent thing to do is to fight back against the deregulatory efforts that I'll talk about a little bit. Um, but that alone isn't enough. If we're ever going to meaningfully afford protections to pigs and other animals who are raised for foods, protections that reflect what the science and popular opinion wants and indicates are warranted, we need to do a lot more. We, so we need to play both defense and offense uh, as lawyers advocating for pigs and other farmed animals. To inform a discussion of how we go about that, I'm going to start by an overview of the current state of our laws protecting pigs. Most people are pretty surprised to learn that we do not have a single federal law on the books protecting pigs or other farmed animals while they are being raised for food. Uh, that's the vast majority of their lives. In fact, our legislators have gone to great lengths to make sure that the animal protection laws we have are not possibly interpreted to apply to animals while they're being farmed. So, for example, the Federal Animal Welfare Act goes so far as to create a definition of animal that says, quote, the term animal excludes farm animals such as but not limited to livestock or poultry used or intended for use as food or fiber. So it literally says farmed animals are not animals for the purpose of this statute. Similarly, the Preventing Animal Cruelty and Torture Act, the PACT Act that was passed with much fanfare last year, it's a federal felony anti-cruelty statute, contains numerous exemptions for farmed animals. And I think this is especially telling because this is a law that was focused on the worst of the worst abuses, specifically anything that was purposefully done to create serious bodily injury, specifically things like crushing, burning, and suffocating an animal. And even with its limitation on just those egregious forms of cruelty, Congress thought it was necessary to make clear that factory farming practices would not possibly be liable under this statute. So there is no federal law limiting what can or cannot be done to animals while they're being raised for food. It's really important to know. So that leaves us with state laws. And unfortunately, they don't fare much better. 
in our society, the way we regulate businesses for the most part is through a regulatory regime. That typically means that in order to operate, a business needs to have a license and they need to undergo routine inspections to assess uh, compliance with minimum standards. And if they don't meet those standards, they lose their license to operate. Um, that's how we regulate almost every business in our society, including businesses that use animals, such as animal experimentation facilities, dog breeders, zoos, and the like. There are absolutely flaws in how this is implemented, and I've written about this at length, but they also do assure some minimum level of accountability. This does not exist with regard to the treatment of farmed animals. What we have instead are criminal cruelty laws. These are extremely broad criminal prohibitions that uh, typically prohibit inflicting, quote, illegal, or, sorry, unnecessary or unjustifiable suffering or cruelty on animals. There's a host of problems with using this as our primary means of regulating an industry and regulating the treatment of animals being raised for food, beginning with this unnecessary or unjustifiable language. Such language indicates that there is some level of human infliction of cruelty that is necessary and justifiable. And some people assume that anything done for the purpose of food production is automatically necessary. So consider the following passage um, as where a New York judge grappled with this kind of language in the New York cruelty statute more than a hundred years ago. He's facing a case with alleged cruelty involving turtles used for food. And the passage is a little long, but I think it's really salient. So the judge said, Quote, I attach considerable importance to the use of the word unjustifiable in connection with the legislative definition of torture or cruelty. It clearly indicates legislative intent and shows that the legislature had in mind that while in certain cases there may be physical pain and suffering, even to the extent of causing death, no criminal proceeding can be sustained unless the pain or cruelty was unnecessary, unjustifiable, and willful. The infliction of pain alone is insufficient for the purpose of such a prosecution as this. But the question is, was unjustifiable pain inflicted? The statute itself contemplates and permits the infliction of a certain amount of pain. Certain physical pain may be necessary and justifiable in given cases. I would call it a legal license permitting the infliction of unavoidable pain. It must have come to the attention of many that the treatment of animals to be used for food while in transit to a stockyard or to a market is sometimes not short of cruel and in some instances torturable. Hogs have the nose perforated and a ring placed in it. Ears of calves are similarly treated. Chickens are crowded into freight cars. These practices have been tolerated on the theory, I assume, that in cases where these organisms are for food consumption, the pain, if any, would be classed as justifiable and necessary. So add to the challenge of such language, the fact that most state cruelty laws carve out explicit exemptions for farmed animals. So Vermont's cruelty code, for example, states that it does not apply to quote, livestock and poultry husbandry practices for raising management and use of animals. The language varies, but most states have similar exemptions. And some argue that these uh, exemptions provide total blanket protections from liability for factory farms. I personally wouldn't go that far and I'm working on a piece of scholarship related to this. I think there are practices that we can and should be challenging despite these exemptions, but nevertheless, they create significant hurdles and they deter prosecutions especially given that we are talking again about criminal cruelty prohibitions that must be proven beyond a reasonable doubt. Without inspections, it's incredibly difficult to detect violations of the animal cruelty laws, let alone prove them beyond a reasonable doubt. In addition, more and more states are passing ag-gag laws, which uh, deter undercover investigations as well as whistleblower reports and thus make detection that much harder. Under this regime, prosecutions for cruelty to pigs and other animals raised for food are incredibly rare. And when they do happen, they tend to focus on egregious cruelty inflicted by low level workers, rather than holding the corporations that control the industry accountable for the banal but horrific routine cruelty that's inflicted on these animals. 
So with no federal oversight of pigs while they're raised for food and very problematic and limited state oversight, we're left just with transport and slaughter. And we do have some basic legal protections for these animals at these last stages of their short lives, but they're fraught with limitations and enforcement problems. As to transport, for more than 100 years, we've had a law on the books, a federal law called the 28-hour law that provides that if you're transporting an animal for more than 28 hours, you need to stop and unload them for food, water, and rest, unless you can provide them food, water, and rest during transport. It's important to note how truly minimal this is. It doesn't say anything about how densely you can pack the animals. It doesn't say anything about temperature control. Um, and as you've heard, these things are extremely important, a matter of life or death often for pigs. And yet even this minimal requirement is very rarely enforced. So just last week, I got a response to a Freedom of Information Act request to the US Department of Agriculture for 28 hour law enforcement records. And what I discovered is that over the course of more than a year, for all the tens of millions of farmed animals transported to slaughter and otherwise, the USDA took just six so-called enforcement actions under the 28-hour law. And all six of those were actually just warnings to the violators. None of them involved pigs, which is notable because the USDA has refused to apply the 28-hour law to birds. So that means that pigs are the majority of animals that is purportedly regulating under the 28-hour law. And as you've heard, pigs are uniquely vulnerable during transport. So technically, bird, uh, pigs have some limited protections during transport, but they're not really being enforced. And then there's slaughter. The Federal Humane Methods of Slaughter Act is supposed to ensure that animals are both humanely slaughtered, meaning that they are rendered unconscious before their throats are slit, and also that they are handled humanely throughout their time at the slaughterhouse. As with the 28-hour law, the USDA has refused to apply the Humane Methods of Slaughter Act to birds who comprise more than 90% of land animals slaughtered for food in this country. So that means that pigs comprise the majority of animals it's reg the, st the agency is regulating under the statute, about 75%. Unfortunately, the agency has done a woefully in inadequate job of enforcing the Humane Methods of Slaughter Act, and that is not just my opinion. The agency's own Office of Inspector General has repeatedly found as much in audit reports. Most recently, in an audit specifically focused on the application of the Humane Methods of Slaughter Act to pigs, the, agents, the Office of Inspector General found, among other things, that the USDA's, quote, enforcement policies do not deter swine slaughter plants from becoming repeat violators. As a result, plants have repeatedly violated the same regulations with little or no consequence. It also found that, quote, inspectors did not take appropriate enforcement actions at eight of the 30 swine slaughter plants we visited for violations of the Humane Methods of Slaughter Act. As a result, the plants did not improve their slaughter practices and the agency could not ensure humane handling of swine. So pretty damning findings. Following this audit, instead of stepping up its game and improving enforcement, the USDA decided to go in the opposite direction and to do even less under the Humane Methods of Slaughter Act. So for many, many years, federal regulation provided that no more than 1,106 pigs could be killed on a slaughter line per hour. That's already a staggering number. That's more than 18 pigs each minute or about one pig every three seconds. Already at these speeds, workers often handle, handle pigs violently to keep up with the, the pace, including dragging, excessive electroshocking, kicking, anything to get the animals to keep moving. Also, already at these speeds, as you heard from Dr. Raleigh, pigs aren't always properly rendered unconscious, meaning they're sometimes fully alert when their throats are slit and sometimes even when they're dropped into scalding tanks that are intended to remove their hair and meant only to be used after they're, they're dead and certainly not conscious. Nevertheless, uh, in an effort to increase profits, industry has been lobbying the USDA for many years for permission to speed up their slaughter lines even further. 
In response to this pressure, the agency created a pilot program under which it allowed five slaughterhouses to disregard the 1,106 um, pigs per hour limit while also reducing inspector oversight. An undercover investigation into one of five of those slaughterhouses, um, which happens to supply Hormel, documented what you might expect. And I'm going to spare you the footage from that uh, investigation. It's available online if you want to see it. Um, what it shows is that workers are forced to take hum inhumane shortcuts that lead to extreme suffering to keep up with the very fast moving line. Among other things, the footage shows pigs being beaten, dragged and repeatedly electroshocked, including on their faces and other sensitive parts of their bodies. Downed pigs, as you heard about those who are too sick or injured to stand or walk, are especially vulnerable in these situations. And the investigation documented drowned, downed pigs being dragged while they were fully conscious, including some with a hook inside of their mouth, a metal hook inside of their mouths. The investigation also documented pigs who weren't properly stunned because of the fast moving line. Some even appeared to still be conscious after having their throats slit. A supervisor was documented acknowledging the frequency of pigs regaining consciousness and saying, quote, sometimes they come back like zombies. Some pigs even showed signs of having entered the scalding tank while still alive and ultimately dying not from having their throats slit, but from scalding or suffocating in the boiling water. In addition, the investigation revealed serious food safety issues arising from the fast line speeds, including numerous carcasses riddled with growths, abscesses, and lumps, some of which were oozing green and yellow pus, as well as carcasses that were visibly contaminated with feces. Indeed, the USDA Office of Inspector General, in evaluating this pilot program, found that three of the slaughterhouses Three of the 10 slaughterhouses with the most food safety violations were uh, in the pilot program, including the slaughterhouse with the single highest rate of violations, which had nearly 50% more than the second highest rate of food safety violations. According to the Office of Inspector General, such slaughterhouses, quote, have less assurance of food safety than a traditional plant. And by a traditional plant, they mean one that is adhering to the line speed limit uh, with full inspection. In addition, injuries to workers are higher at faster line speeds. And this is notable because slaughterhouse workers already have one of the highest rates of injuries of any industry in the United States. Despite this plethora of issues, last fall, the USDA adopted a final rule to allow any slaughterhouse that wants to, to disregard the federal line speed limit and also to reduce inspector oversight, which means not only are humane handling violations, but food and safe, food safety violations more likely to occur, they are less likely to be detected because there are fewer inspectors on the line. When that rule was proposed, the agency received more than 83,000 comments and an analysis by the Washington Post found that more than 87% of those opposed the rule. And the op opposition was extremely diverse. It included animal protection groups, of course, but it also included current and former USDA inspectors, slaughterhouse workers, labor unions, public health organizations, consumer protection organizations, environmental protection organizations, and so on. In fact, according to the USDA, only the benefiting swine slaughter establishments, trade associations representing the pork industry, and a handful of private citizens submitted comments in support of the rule. In justifying this deregulatory move, the USDA bragged that it would facilitate the slaughter of about 11.5 million pigs each year, uh, thereby allowing the industry to profit by about $90 million each year. The agency specifically identified 40 slaughterhouses that are responsible for 93% of the pigs slaughtered in this country that it had determined would adopt this deregulatory system. So it's, it's worth underscoring that this rule means that the vast majority of pigs slaughtered in this country would be slaughtered at faster line speeds and with reduced oversight. And that includes pigs from farms that claim to provide higher welfare. They're still going to these same slaughterhouses.
Despite the overwhelming opposition, this deregulatory rule went into effect in December. And I am proud to say that that same month, my animal law litigation clinic at Lewis and Clark Center for Animal Law Studies filed a lawsuit on behalf of seven animal and environmental protection organizations challenging that rule. And that lawsuit is ongoing and it is critical to ensure that this, the few protections pigs have under the Humane Methods of Slaughter Act remain intact. A couple months later, we filed a second lawsuit. This one focused on um, downed pigs specifically and on behalf of another coalition of seven organizations. As you heard, every year more than half a million pigs arrive at the slaughterhouse downed, unable to walk or stand. More go down after they arrive and these animals are particularly vulnerable. But the USDA continues to allow them to be slaughtered for food because they're worth more money if they can be uh, forced to walk to their deaths, they're often set aside in pens in the hopes that they'll eventually get up because they can't stand. They are languishing on feces riddled floors. They are routinely deprived of veterinary care, food, painkillers while they're set aside in these pens. And if they do not get up on their own, they're often violently forced up through electroshocks, kicking, punching, Failing that, they are sometimes dragged while they're conscious. Uh, nearly two decades ago, Congress directed the U.S. Department of Agriculture through statute to study and report on the issue of downed livestock and based on that report to determine if regulations were necessary to protect these animals. Despite the passage of nearly two decades, the USDA has defied that mandate. In addition, last year, just the day before it announced that it would be deregulating pig slaughter, the USDA denied a petition for rulemaking that urged it to ban the slaughter of downed pigs to protect uh, human health and animal welfare, both just as the agency had previously done with downed cattle. So our second lawsuit challenges both the USDA's longstanding defiance of Congress's mandates, as well as that denial of the petition for rulemaking, which disregarded the luminous evidence about the suffering of downed pigs at slaughter, as well as serious risks of antibiotic uh, resistant, as well as potentially fatal diseases that downed pigs pose to humans. And this lawsuit is also go ongoing and is also necessary to hold the government accountable for disregarding the bare minimum protections that Congress already said these animals should be entitled to. But if we're going to bring our laws into line with what our values and the science suggest is appropriate, we have a lot more work to do and we have to do it on every level, federal, state, and local. Historically, federal uh, protections for farmed animals have been incredibly difficult to enact, um, but I think the tide is starting to turn. We have federal laws pending like the Farm System Reform Act, uh, which is uh, S3221 and HR6718. That's a bill that Senator Booker introduced and uh, Senator Warren is co-sponsoring. And it's not specifically focused on the treatment of farmed animals, but it would do a host of things to expedite the end of factory farming, including placing an immediate moratorium on the expansion or construction of new factory farms, phasing out all lodge factory farms by 2040, and providing extensive funding to help farmers transition away from factory farming. Also, just this month, federal legislation was introduced to address the deregulation of pig slaughter that I talked about, the Safe Line Speeds in COVID-19 Act, that's HR 7521, would halt the implementation of the deregulatory rule. And Senator Booker has indicated that he plans to introduce a companion bill when the Senate is back in session. On the state level, a handful of states have passed laws banning some of factory farming's cruelest confinement systems, including 10 states that have banned the gestation crates that Dr. Rowley discussed. But I think there's a lot more that we can be doing on the state and local level. I've spent much of my animal law career advocating for elephants who were exploited in the circus, um, particularly those used by Ringling Brothers, and a huge part of what helped us end 
Ringling Brothers Exploitation of Elephants was working with grassroots activists to enact local ordinances. And those local laws eventually translated into state laws, and now there are federal laws pending. And we're seeing similar local and state laws protecting animals bred for the pet trade and the fur trade. And there's no reason we can't use these same avenues on behalf of farmed animals. So to wrap up so that we can take your questions, although we're in the midst of a deregulatory era that threatens to scale back what little protections we've achieved for pigs and other farmed animals, we're at a unique crossroads. COVID-19 with its disproportionate effect on slaughterhouse workers has really shed a light on some of the fundamental shortcomings of our food system and the interlinked ways in which animals, workers, consumers, the environment, neighbors are all being exploited by a small handful of multi-billion dollar multinational corporations. And that's all thanks to laws that have been crafted to help these corporations. I know not all of you are going to go out and become lobbyists for pigs, but I hope that you will support these legal efforts. Um, and I also hope that you'll consider whether your eating habits align with your values. And finally, because this has been very heavy, I would like to give a shout out to Esther the Wonder Pig and encourage you to follow her on social media for happy pig updates because there are some amazing pig stories out there. Thank you. Wow, thank you so much for that talk. A grim, a grim subject, but an important one. Uh, to our audience, we have a few minutes to ask some questions. And as a reminder, for those of you watching from the website live stream, you can click on the watch on live stream icon at the bottom of the video to bring up the chat box and you can add your question there. And if you're watching on our Facebook live stream, add your question to the comment box below and we'll try to get to as many as we can. Our first question, um, you talked about a number of um, new laws and new strategies like at the, at the local level um, is, is forcing administrative action at the agency level a possibility or is that so um, political that it that there's nothing to be done it does it really need to be the adoption of new laws i think it has to be both it has to be everything and forcing administrative action uh, at the federal level can be quite difficult um, due to precedent, for example, you can't challenge an agency's enforcement failures typically, but there are some avenues that we can challenge like those that we've identified in our litigation. And I think we need to work really hard to identify those points that we can target and also to use political pressure to change things. Ultimately, I honestly think we need a, a new agency, a separate agency that is tasked with enforcing these laws because the USDA, not just in this administration, but over the years has shown uh, it has no interest in, in protecting these animals. So I think looking forward, we absolutely need to be looking at the agency piece of it, but also the local and state laws. And those are going to help make the federal efforts easier. That could be a good transition to another question, which is, would you expect to see changes in these challenges under a Biden administration? I would absolutely hope so, and I am perhaps irrationally optimistic. I we haven't we didn't have time to get into a lot of the detail about how COVID has affected all of this, but there is more attention to how fundamentally broken our food system is right now. Um, I think we are at a moment when we can address these and we're talking about them publicly in a way that we haven't before. So yes, I do think so. Dr. Raleigh, I don't know if you agree. Yes, com I completely agree. Okay. Um, a couple of legal questions. One, a listener is curious why you chose the Western District of New York to file your complaint. Um, so our, we represent a coalition of seven different organizations that are located all over the country. So um, we, we 
had to pick somewhere where one of our clients was based and our lead plaintiff farm sanctuary, which is the nation's leading farmed animal protection organization and farmed animal sanctuary is based in the Western district of New York. Um, the Western district of New York also happens to have very good standing law. So it was fortuitous. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, another question, who might have standing to sue to get the USDA to enforce? Is there anyone like maybe factory workers? It's a really good question. So mm -hmm. before we get to the standing question, I'll elaborate a little bit on something I alluded to before, which is that um, generally, this is a case out of the Supreme Court called Heckler versus Cheney, that says you can't challenge an agency's enforcement decisions. Basically, it says an agency's enforcement decisions are akin to prosecutorial discretion, and they have extremely broad discretion in deciding how they're going to enforce a law. There are a few exceptions carved out in a footnote in that decision, but it's extremely hard to um, successfully show that the exception applies. So. Um, it's hard to challenge enforcement, but if you can challenge something like an affirmative agency action, such as the denial of the petition for rulemaking to protect down pigs or the, the final rule deregulating pig slaughter, you still face these standing hurdles. And there are a number of approaches. Uh, workers is one. Um, in addition to the lawsuit that our clinic has brought, uh, there, uh, unions have brought a lawsuit challenging the deregulatory rule as well on behalf of the workers who are at risk. And um, already they've survived the motion to dismiss on standing grounds. In our case, we have two primary standing theories and we're waiting for the court's decision on that. Um, the first is based on a Supreme Court decision called Havens Realty versus Coleman. And that stands for the proposition that if an organization's mission is frustrated and they're forced to divert resources as a result, that can be sufficient for standing. So our plaintiffs allege that. In addition, they allege standing on behalf of their members who consume pork products and are at heightened health risks as a result of the USDA's actions and inactions. Um, we also have in the, de the challenge to deregulation, we have an environmental law claim. So um, by facilitating the slaughter and factory farming of 11.5 million more pigs each year, uh, the agency is affecting the well-being of people who recreate in areas around um, some of the bigger factory farms. So those are some of the theories. There are a lot of different approaches out there. Okay. Um, next question. Which 501c4 and PAC is lobbying most successfully on farm animal protection issues? If there isn't one, would setting up one be helpful? There, I don't know that I would say there's one that is um, singularly most successful. I think we can always use more help, but there's some amazing coalitions um, coming to the fore right now. With, so there are animal protection groups doing this work, um, Mercy for Animals, Farm Sanctuary, some of your, you know, the well-known bigger groups um, like the Humane Society Legislative Fund and the ASPCA have been active in addition to the smaller groups. Labor groups um, are also working together. Um, so, uh, it, and this I think is partly due to what COVID has shined the light on. We're seeing these coalitions in a way we've never seen before that need to be happening because this exploitation is across the board. The workers are treated not much better than the animals. Okay. Um, next question. As some state laws have banned gestation crates, and other confinement regimes, are state agencies successfully enforcing these laws like, um, or successfully enforcing these laws unlike poor federal enforcement of HMSA, the 28 hour rule, et cetera? It's a really good question. That's something I'm analyzing right now. Um, a lot of these laws had really long phase in periods. So some of them haven't even gone into effect yet. And I'm looking right now on the enforcement mechanisms and a lot of them don't have inspection requirements. So it's it's an open question as to how well these are going to be enforced. And it's something I think we really need to be keeping an eye on. Okay. Um, there is some interest from the listeners in knowing more about the Booker Warren bill in the Senate and House. So I don't know if you could give any more information or um, even a bill number if you have them at your fingertips, but how can people learn more? 
Um, yeah, so it's um, it's the Farm System Reform Act. The Senate bill is S3221, and the House bill is HR6718. Um, and I know that um, Mercy for Animals and Animal Equality and a number of other organizations have alerts up on their websites that have information about these bills, as well as how you can um, contact your legislators to urge them to support. Perfect, thank you. Okay, we have to wrap up there. Our speakers have to get to class at one o'clock. Um, so thank you so much to both of you for your presentation and thank you to our viewers for joining us today. Our next Hot Topics talk will take place on July 23rd in a couple days and we hope that we'll see you then. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Thank you.